The Threshery has an incredible schedule of events and opportunities for everyone to enjoy. There is chainsaw competition, antique tractor pull. Um, we have uh, incredible orchestras. We've got a polka band, a barn dance. We have a polka mass with the Jerry Volkler Orchestra. We have great country modern music with the modern day drifters. Um, a Lutheran religious service with Pastor Ben Anstad. We have the Lakeshore Garden Tractor Pullers, Thresher Man of the Year. It's going to be announced at the pull. We have kids tractor pull uh, events. We have the Bidoff Brothers, a cavalcade of power, which is an incredible parade of antique machines in front of the grandstand. We have a mud pig wrestling contest and a barrel race. It goes on and on. It's to be enjoyed by all. It's the Antique Power Association's Threshery. August 20th, uh, 2011, and we're here outside of Valmy at the 29th Annual Threshery. The Threshery, as you know, is a celebration of farm life in the past here in Door County. It, 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 it goes back in history some 29 years from an early grouping of enthusiasts to preserve the past of the Door County um, farming industry. We were here to celebrate the past, look at antique farm equipment, whether it be uh, tractors, sawmills, uh, a whole array of machinery and practices where they are preserving it here for the present, for all of us to enjoy and try to understand today. And the enthusiasts will carry this into the future and the lives of our children. Let's go in and see what's going on at the Threshery. Obviously the blacksmith was the, literally the center of it in most villages. And you needed spoons made, forks made, there was no store to go to. That's right. You had to go to the blacksmith and they made them, and including the tools and all the parts that went with it. And that's why the blacksmith was literally the beginning of a lot of this stuff. Yes. And he was, pr he was really the initiation 
of a lot of the Industrial Revolution as well. It was through the blacksmith's um, manufacture of the tools that helped people to expand their horizons on what they could do both on the farm and then eventually in the cities. And be able to fix anything except the broken heart. Uh, the broken heart, they came to you for other reasons? They also, they also showed the blacksmith that one of the things they did when they baptized babies, they would do it on the anvil because that was considered lucky. We're here with uh, another grouping uh, at the Threshery and they're commemorating uh, very early life here in Door County, probably commemorating some of the very earliest uh, Caucasian settlers to this area. Your first name, sir? Joe. Hi, Joe. And your first name? Brandy. Hi, Brandy. And so we're doing something in a, in a more modern way, but something that has been done for centuries. You're doing a, a, some very intricate beading, Brandy. Is that correct? Yes. And what sorts of things would you make by doing beading? You could make anything from a bracelet to an anklet or a necklace or just a keychain for something. Just basically anything that you can think of that it will be attached to something. I got a cigar in there so I don't smoke any more cigars. And I got a stick of gum in case I uh, do get the urge to smoke a cigar. You know, very practical and uh, a w all good medicine going on. Both a reminder and a practical alternative. Great talking with you. Uh, you have a great uh, reproduction little uh, campsite here and it really adds to the flavor and feeling of, of this year's Threshery. Thank you. Thank We're here you. with another uh, lovely lady on a beautiful day and a very lovely old piece of uh, equipment. I believe this is a, what kind of equipment is this? It's a corn husker. And your name please? Linda Geisel. I, Linda Geisel, how are you? Part of the famous Geisel family. Yes, I Great. am. And so this corn husker would be used on every farm to remove the uh, all the uh, vegetative matter aside from the actual um, the uh, the corn itself. Yes, yes and it cleaned it all up. Very nicely too. And so every farm would have these. They would usually be run from power takeoffs off of tractors. Yeah. And or belts. Belt. This one's run with a belt. On a, off a belt takeoff. And so they'd be used really just uh, in the autumn after the corn is dried. Is yes. It? Yeah. And we're here at the Threshery and uh, we're, we're observing the construction of a shed for the sawmill. And they're actually constructing it before our very eyes using uh, lumber on site. And we're here with a member of the family that operates this uh, sawmill. Your name, sir? Brian Henschel. Brian, it's good to see you again this year. And you're part of this very illustrious uh, historic family of Dora County with one of the finest farms we have. Um, your family, besides many aspects of farming, also has a, an incredible sawmill that supplies a lot of the dimensional lumber, decking, and uh, other lumber needs for many of the people in Dora County. Correct. Yeah, we're enjoying a deck at our house supplied by your family. Thank you. You're welcome. So tell us about the operation that is going on. I see your parents are working together so beautifully, um, uh, working the sawmill. Can you tell me a little of the history of the, this particular sawmill first? Well, first of all, it's a circle sawmill, and it's a hand-driven carriage system. You have to pull the one rod to make the log come out to have like a one inch board or a two inch board and now these days it's a bandsaw so it's an older style mill. Uh -huh. Is there any advantage over this or is it merely we're trying to preserve what was done historically? Well a circle saw mill you can change blades in it and it 
you could saw a lot more lumber with it compared to a band saw. If you don't keep the band sharp, she starts warping and you get all different sizes of lumber. Got it. All right. So this also has, does this have the interchangeable teeth uh, teeth on the saw blade itself? Yes, it does. Okay. How often, do you, and, uh, during, if you're operating it all day, would you think you'd have to change those, Brian? It all depends if you hit something in the log. Uh, sure, sure, yeah, then it's splinter time, right? And so they're creating some dimensional lumber right now. What is that dimensional lumber going to be used for? Probably for siding for the new building they're putting up over the sawmill. So this will be our permanent building over this antique sawmill, and they're doing it in um, antique fashion. They're doing mortise and tenon construction. Uh, they've sawed these, uh, uh, all the vertical and horizontal members uh, on this sawmill. They look like uh, eight by eights or something like that. Yep. And then to make the uh, mortise and tenon, is that done with chisels or uh, what, what is the fashion in which that's done? Old fashioned chisels and chainsaws. And new fashioned chainsaws to get it going. Yep. yep. And uh, it's a wonderful structure. It's going to be here for the future to enjoy this exhibit. And uh, someday I think we're going to be seeing you, Brian, uh, have mom step aside and uh, you operating that uh, incredible mill. Correct. Hey, great seeing you. And uh, school's starting pretty soon, Brian, so we're looking forward to that year and seeing you achieve great things. Yep. Thanks, man. And we're here with Mike Henschel at the uh, sawmill itself. And Brian described some of the aspects of the sawmill. How are you doing today, Mike? Good. 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 And you've got incredible energy. Of course, that energy is surpassed by the energy of your wife, Jamie. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Keeps you going, doesn't it? Yeah. Yep. And so you were just saying some things about this, the operation of this incredible circular sawmill. Could you relate to uh, all the viewers uh, what you were saying? Sure. Uh, we're explaining the teeth. They're interchangeable teeth on here, and you can sharpen them. And uh, I had an uncle with interchangeable teeth. teeth did yeah, you? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Set them on the yeah. sink at night. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, these are just regular steel teeth in here. Some mill, our mill, we run chrome teeth. They're harder. Uh, with the regular steel teeth, we normally run about three hours on a sharpening if you don't hit nothing. Chrome teeth, we go once a day or every other day, depending on what species of wood we saw. Uh, some of the bigger mills run carbide teeth. Not too many do because they're more expensive, and if you do hit something, they shatter like glass. Oh, sure. Yeah, they yeah, keep a yeah, long, yeah. the more carbide brittle. keeps a longer edge, yeah, you know, yeah. but if you hit something, they shatter and they're very expensive. And so, so there are, obviously, this is an antique blade, I would judge. Uh, no, okay. you still can buy them brand new yet. A blade this size is between $2,600 and $3,000. My goodness. The uh, chrome teeth, just this part here, I think we're paying $2.12 right now per tooth. This holder right here, it holds the teeth in, them are around $9, $9 and something. And so do you, does your accountant, uh, meaning your wife, stay yeah. awake at night thinking oh, yeah. about this? Well, yeah. especially when she hits the nail, she knows well, what it costs yeah, her. Yeah. <laughs> or hopefully she doesn't hit her own nail. <laughs> yeah. Yes, and so you've had this particular mill for how long? Um, ever since the club moved up here. This is okay. the club's mill. And was so. this uh, your father-in-law's or originally part of his collection? Uh, no, I can't remember where they got this mill from. But, uh, but it was in operation perhaps yeah, up here? Yeah, the guy that they bought it from was using it. Yeah. So. so you uh, do, uh, besides this uh, exhibit, you do all sorts of uh, dimensional uh, lumber for all the people of Dora yeah, County. Yeah. We saw uh, the new beams for here, the longer ones, and some of these, uh, they had a bandsaw mill cut them because we don't have a long enough track on our mill. We're lucky enough to have a minute with the better half of this combo, <laughs> Jamie Henschel. How are you today? Real good. How are you doing? Please step in here. I think uh, much better than filming me. Um, and so uh, we saw you at work. You had your safety hat on. You were very, uh, uh, very uh, high concentration doing this uh, operation. You have to be. There's no room for error on something no, like this. No, so. there is not. And so how similar is this to the mill that you run at home? Pretty basic. It's the same kerf of a cut on it. Um, it's just the hydraulics run 
on ours we got hydraulics here it's all belt driven I see. and the lever runs opposite of what I'm used to oh my so you do have to think you rethink yes. yes and so this is all muscle power as opposed right. to any hydraulic assist that's correct and so how many um, uh, who inspired you to make this shed over this exhibit which has been going on for years well, it was just common sense. The mill, <laughs> <laughs> the mill's made out of wood, and yes. it was deteriorating. Yes. So it's time to put something. Over Wonderful. There. So, uh, is all this lumber from your property? As well? Some of it is, and some other club members brought in Excellent. and had it milled up. Excellent. And so these are what eight by eight, ten by ten? All eight by eights, white pine. And so when we use the word two by four. Uh, in the historical sense that used to be two inch by four inch, when did things change to whatever today's dimensions are and why? I couldn't even tell you when uh, yeah. we made it down two inch and a half by three and a half as standard now. Yeah. So, But all these here, I'll cut a full eight by eight. The four by fours are a full four by four. So your constructing is really in the tradition fashion in which barns would have been constructed uh, a century and a half yeah. ago. Right. Mm -hmm. Tim and yeah. Tom uh, Sokup are building the building over here and they're doing all the notching and Don's stuff on the building. Notching. And Don, so. yeah. Terrific, terrific. So any, uh, if a person wants to get into uh, hobby um, milling um, they should contact you and be and find out the better points right yep. great yep. Well, it's uh, great talking to you both you and uh, great seeing what you're doing and continue to do uh, very diverse people uh, really the heart of Dora County thank you no, thank, thank you. you thank you appreciate it sorry oh yeah yeah <laughs> um, we're aware that your farm is very, very diverse. You produce lumber, you have your standard cropland, you have cattle, you have um, uh, a dairy operation, you produce maple syrup, you, you're instrumental at the Door County Dairy Breakfast, but there's also your pigs. Tell us about your pigs. Uh, our pigs, we just raise them farrow to finish. We got about 40 sows and we sell them as halves and holes. Customers purchase them and... Through uh, through your farm? Mostly through Merchants Red Hall and Brussels. Merchants and Door County Custom Meats. Wonderful, so good. So we're looking forward to uh, some good ribs and uh, chops a little later in the season? Oh yeah. Summertime side pork. <laughs> Excellent, thank you again. Yep. You're See you later. Thanks. So we're here exploring this uh, threshery, this fair that's a tribute to farming and uh, farm practices from uh, the days gone by and we're back with the uh, Henschels and your name sir? Uh, Don Desjardins. Uh, Don Desjardins and uh, you're from Green Bay. Green Bay yeah. I understand one of your primary functions besides being, is it uncle to Jamie? Yeah. Yep. He's an uncle to my husband yeah. Mike. Uh, uncle to the husband, so that makes uh, him like a step uncle, uh, like a uh, uncle, that'll uh, yeah, something work. like that. And so I understand one of your functions to make this uh, great event great is you mow the grass up here. Yes, I start on Monday morning and I mow this whole area. I mean, from road to road and all the. the area in Small this area. area. Yeah. So uh, this year, unfortunately, you're mowing a lot of hay and dust. Yeah, I ate a lot of dust. Yeah, yeah I'm sure you did, and we are appreciative of you keeping us so clean and clear. It's it's great for the whole family to stroll these grounds and have such a clean environment and uh, nice environment. The uh, so tell us uh, uh, stories about this wonderful family that we're visiting today. We uh, got started about 25 years ago as a hobby. And then all of a sudden it got bigger and bigger, and now it's a full-time operation, right? Pretty much, pretty much right now so it is. Been, uh, and I enjoy coming up here and helping them, you know. And they enjoy seeing you as well, and uh, all the viewers enjoyed meeting you. Sure, sure, sure. And I work for a wonderful or or organization. Which is? The Treasury deal. Oh, yes, indeed. Yeah, they're very wonderful people to well, work with. Warm people, welcoming people, kind of the heart and soul of Dora County. Uh, we're here, I think, I'm going to call this maybe the tractor garden, and it's growing and growing as we walk through the rows. I'm with two uh, great tractor enthusiasts. Your name, sir? 
Peter Nielsen. Peter and yours? Walt Nielsen. Walt, and are you any relationship? <laughs> yes. And yeah. Father and son, so father. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and I'm good, I'm good, I'm so good. So uh, you guys are sort of experts, I've been told by some of the people out there yeah, in yeah. John Deere tractors. You know, we have a few. You have a few, and yeah. you have uh, how many gallons of green paint do you think you have at home? I probably have three gallons on the shelf right now. Just ready to go at any oh, time. Yeah. yeah, I have three or four, too. Yeah. So, so what was your first romance? How did you fall in love with John Deere's as opposed to Massey's or IH? Well, I had a kind of a week back, and they were the first ones to come with a backrest on the seat. And and nothing mechanical? No, that's the reason I bought it. Yeah. And, and you didn't have some old plywood and cushions that you no, could have done No, that? no, no. Everybody else had a, just a, a pan seat, right. and it, it hurt your back. And so the John Deere come out with that, and we enjoyed it. Wonderful. Yeah. So, so John Deere, by making that kind of innovation, uh, gained uh, expert customers yeah. such as That's yourself. correct. That's correct, yeah. And from there on, what, uh, what kind of superior mechanics do you think John Deere brought to the front and track? John Deere was, a f they, they uh, pursued uh, low fuel consumption, and from then on, they had it, you know. Now, they, that was unheard of, and that was in the 50s? Yes, uh, yes, in the 50s. They started out and, and farm all, and the rest of them just kept blinking more gas, and they were taking less. Interesting, interesting. So that, do you think that was from input from the farmers uh, back into John Deere? Or? Yes, it was, but they had a new man by the name of Hewitt, William Hewitt. He was John Deere's grand, let's see, he was his uh, son-in-law, wasn't he? I, I believe so, yeah. So there actually was a John Deere. Oh, yes, absolutely, yeah, yeah. But Hewitt said we're going to say we're always number two, and we said we're going to be number one, and they started with fuel consumption, and they started winning. Great. I mean, that's American innovation at its finest. Uh, who was number one at that time? Farmall. Farmall, yeah, and they produced a lot of the smaller farmers. Yeah. Yes, they did. Farm yeah. tractors. Mm -hmm. Now, tell us about this particular uh, tractor. It's uh, it's got lots of green paint on it. I'm guessing <laughs> I'm guessing it has a great deal of power. Um, so tell us the age and how long you've had it and what's special about it. This is a 1956 uh, John Deere 70 diesel, and it's very efficient. Runs on about a gallon an hour when you're working it. That's remarkable. Yes, it is. Very nice tractor. We put it on the sawmill, and, and uh, we take a gallon an hour sawing hard, you know. Yes. Mm -hmm. So what do you think those great big four-wheel tractors consume that I see at work in the fields these days? Well, they may take a lot. I have no idea. We don't get into that big stuff, but they sell a lot of them, and they and the farmers are happy with them. So, so I know there's a return oh, based sure. on yeah. the yeah. size yeah. and efficiency. So they're, they're probably three, 400 horse, and they do a lot of work. You know, they're, they're probably pulling uh, uh, 40, 60 feet. John Deere makes a corn planter now that's 48 rows, plants 75 acres an hour. My goodness, my goodness. So are these still all made in America? Oh, well, they have, they have plants all over. These are all made in Waterloo, Iowa. You know. Peter, we're looking, at, uh, we're looking at a smaller John Deere, and I think this is called the corn picker. Uh, can you tell us anything about this particular? Uh, no, the corn picker thing is just what he has for sale on this. Uh, another implement. Yeah, another implement. This is a John Deere LA. Uh, made from 1941 to 46. So during the war? Yes. 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 They, uh, they made an L from 37 on, which is just a, a small sister to this. They came out with this in 41. Um, uh, a step up, a significant step up in power, actually, and it was uh, it was designed uh, to replace a team of mules. That was the idea. Uh -huh. uh, so, so it had that kind of power as two mules or yeah. four mules might. Have. Yes. Yeah. So, so is this diesel or gasoline? Gasoline. And two cylinder two or? Two cylinder. Yeah, uh -huh. two cylinder. It, uh, they, they uh, were very, very popular on small, uh, small truck farms, vegetable growers, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, it looks uh, very strong and very serviceable. It is. It is. Again, really too tiny for for farming farming but again for vegetable farming and stuff these things went wild are, are are parts available for a model such as this today as a matter of fact i've just begun a restoration one on on a, a 44 exactly a 1944 la just like this and yes what 
what parts aren't available from John Deere and they're you know they're they're providing less and less what parts aren't available from John Deere though there's almost always an aftermarket uh, company that'll pick it up yeah. marvelous and you're doing it purely out of the love of restoration of uh, tractors from years ago uh, I am uh, fair to say I have a passion for these old John Deere's. Uh, well, thank God for people like you having that passion and we can all come here and enjoy the features of these beautiful tractors. Let's go to another John Deere and uh, sure. a big brother over here. So Peter, we're looking at another big daddy. This is uh, John Deere 730. I'm seeing decals on it to say power steering uh, it's uh, it's pretty high model I think high end it has the uh, yellow uh, and green to give us even greater beauty with uh, a red cap on there for the for the fuel <laughs> and so tell us uh, particular features about this uh, beautiful tractor this is the uh, this is the end of the two-cylinder era. Up until 1960, all John Deere made was two-cylinder tractors, and they they kept that uh, engineering theme going until uh, the power needs for normal farming was more than two cylinders could uh, put up with. So this is the uh, this is the king right here of row crop. John Deere two cylinders. So this. bow to the king, the great 730. The 730 for its day, in its day, was a uh, was it was the king of the hill. There's so how did this uh, 730 compare to the subsequent model that uh, replaced it as they were going into four cylinder? I imagine. Yes, in 1960, John Deere went with uh, they called it the new generation of power and uh, re-engineered the whole thing, and then started doing uh, three-cylinder, four-cylinder, six-cylinder, however much power and tractor needed. That's how big an engine they would make for. It. And it's called the R. And tell us about this R. Uh, from 1923 on, John Deere made uh, what they called the Model D. Um, which was their uh, field work tractor. Uh, by the time World War II was over, well actually they started engineering this late in the 30s. They knew that the D was uh, uh, kind of at the end of its line in terms of how much power they could get out of that uh, platform. So in the late 30s they started engineering this uh, and they wanted to, to uh, get into the diesel world too. Uh, Caterpillar had uh, done remarkable things about making diesel engines work um, and uh, there is actually even uh, some hint of uh, historical data that uh, John Deere, uh, Caterpillar worked with John Deere I should say in the engineering in this engine um, but they brought this out in 49 uh, this one it says happens to be a 52 they built this from 49 until 54 I believe but this was the first John Deere diesel tractor and when this came out in 49 it was spoken of in whispers. Uh, 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 this was the tractor for big open field work. Uh, the, the Great Plains, the High Plains out west, uh, they went wild with these tractors. <laughs> 